I'd like to talk through some details of the robot party exercise as we find it on the course website. We'll start with just talking about the local version before we get to the networked idea. So let's go through, mostly this will be a code walkthrough, but let's talk about a couple elements of the arena. So here's the sample world, it's called party sample. And uh, it includes the clock just for fun. You can ignore that if you want. Um, a few things to note are it has uh, three of these new diff drive robots. I call them wobbly because they have a low center of mass. So let's just see a little bit of motion just to get a feel for this. Um, so they can roll, they can turn in place, they can go forward and backward. And um, as they roll, they tend to kind of wobble around, as you can tell from the bodies kind of tipping up and down. So the key idea of this, of this exercise is to experiment with emergent behavior of a group. And a group can be, you know, let's say three or more of these. And the idea is there's some way they have of, of interacting with each other as they go. And we can experiment with those rules to see what kind of behavior we can get out of the group. So before we begin into the real the code walkthrough, which is the bulk of this, let's look at one more detail of this. There is a ramp object in the arena. I want to just point out how that was accomplished. It's a solid, so it has a, a collision uh, model. And then the shape of it is a elevation grid. So an elevation grid is a primitive form that's meant for ground models. And if you look down inside there, it has a height matrix. This is only defined by four points, but it's a, it's a two-dimensional matrix of altitudes. And obviously the sides are open. It does some interpolation there. But that's, a, that's an easy way for us to try to think about building in some kind of sloped ground obstacles um, that could be obviously considerably more detailed. Um, there's also some kind of other randomized ground that can be used to model outdoors. Uh, but this seems like a, a great, good way to get kind of other kind of ground obstacles. So that's the ramp. And if we're going to build a circus, might, might, need, might need more ramps, um, balance beams, anyone? These are kind of other ways to add some kind of diversity to the world. So let's look more at the wobbly. The wobbly here is, um, it's uh, defined by a protofile, so there aren't that many parameters visible at top level here. Let's just go ahead and show you a couple, uh, couple points of the protofile, though. Um, here's the wobbly. It's a body um, with uh, a couple of wheels. There are some parameters. You can, not, you can customize these wobblies a little bit if you like. You can uh, you know, change the body color to, to something else, um, and that'll, that'll simply change the, the, the rendering of it. Um, there is some uh, calculations that if the wheel radius is changed, I'm going to change this from 10 centimeters to 20 centimeters, a lot of other things change in proportion. The, the, the stalk gets longer, uh, the body mass gets longer, and there's also an axle length which governs the width. Here it's 14 centimeters. If I change that to 30, then the, not as much changes then, but the axle does separate out. And then the same controller should basically work with that, although I will warn you, the motor parameters are not changed in concert with the masses. So if we run this now, um, whoop, we crashed WeeBots. We're going we're gonna to edit this section out and come back. We're back now after my WeeBots crash. I relaunched things. If you recall, we were at uh, setting up a WeeBot to a, I'm sorry, a Wobbly to a different size. I'm now going to just try letting that run and see what happens. And it still will work, although the motor parameters haven't changed, so it might not be quite as strong. But it does still function. So if you'd like to customize your flock a little bit, that is something to consider doing. Um, so anyway, so that is the, I'm going to, going to pause this now and just revert back to the default world. Actually, no need to do that. We'll look at the code. So the bulk of this explanation will be walking through some of the code behind this robot. And I'll say before I begin, this particular performance is kind of a, just a demo I put together out of the primitives. It's not particularly smart because the two robots on the left are each trying to follow the nearest robot, which in most cases happens to be each other. So they get immediately locked into kind of a, a, a dance where they're just sort of literally facing each other, trying to keep a, a, a close distance apart, while the, the larger robot now is doing a random walk. So it kind of wanders off. So this quickly finds a, a sort of uninteresting stable point where the two robots following each other are just going to kind of sit there and move back and forth while the third one is off uh, kind of wandering the world. So let's, let's look at the code to understand a little bit how this was implemented and that will give you a, a stronger guide as to how to customize this for your own project. So I'm going to just look at the controller. There's one controller that runs in all three of them and we'll just look at it kind of here inside the WeeBots window. So the first thing to know is there, it's Python still, but there is now class structure. If you are a uh, seasoned uh, Python programmer, then 
no doubt you've encountered using classes. Um, if you've not, and I've noted that a lot of beginning Python programmers, they teach you scripting and how to do expressions and kind of use data structures, but they don't actually get to classes. I'll say classes are really core to uh, any kind of serious programming in Python. And so um, this is using them as a way to kind of provide a kind of more standardized notation for having a bunch of functions that work on the same data. Um, I think you won't be able to have, you won't have too much trouble at least grasping how to use it in this case because it's relatively straightforward use of the form. And it's really just a singleton. At the end of this script, um, which is a couple hundred lines long, um, simply there is one of these, uh, one instance of this wobbly class created and then simply executed. So in this particular context, it's not used for all the myriad ways that you might use objects. It's more used as just a way to provide a, a container for all of the functions that define the wobbly. So that aside, um, so being a class, it has an init function, which is called when it's initialized. And this is where a lot of the previous script ends up um, because this is which handles the kind of typical robot initialization of like fetching handles for the motors and setting up the low level PID control and fetching all the sensors. There's a lot of sensors in this gadget. Um, key to note are uh, it has the motors and range finders similar to, well, this has actually a pair of range finders, um, which are not currently being used, but are being read. It also has um, a simulation of a local radio network. This is the chief means by which these particular models uh, recognize each other's location. Each, they're each transmitting at some rate packets across the simulated network that simply self-report their location and orientation. That's using the receiver and emitter objects. They have a GPS receiver, which in this case tells the robot its location in world XYZ coordinates. And they have a compass, which tells each robot the direction of the north vector. In the world coordinates that we're using, north is defined along the y-axis, the plus y-axis in the world. And so when your compass, re uh, that vector is reported in body coordinates and then can be used to generate a kind of traditional heading, which is uh, traditionally zero degrees at north and 90 degrees at east and going around from there. So those are some of, and then I'm sorry, there's also an accelerometer which reports the direction of the local gravity vector. Um, although one has to be careful because an accelerometer is a mass on a spring it responds both to static gravity as well as to accelerations. This particular accelerometer is placed at the midpoint of the axle. So it's mostly immune to body motion, but it would see some signal from uh, acceleration, especially laterally. So that's so sort of that, that initial function, the init function handles a lot of this setup. Um, there's a couple of values here for the wheel radius and the axle length that are used by the, by the code that are not actually read back from the geometry. So if one does change the model, uh, one should find some way of customizing the wheel length, um, wheel radius and axle length if you want the controllers to act kind of as, as designed. Um, so that's sort of the, this should at least be relatively familiar. The one bit of notation that's very much, C, um, sorry, Python class oriented is all these variables now are prefixed with self dot. This is a Python notation saying that uh, for an instance of this class wobbly, there's a namespace, which is this, uh, uh, fields of the object itself that are prefixed with self. And they're, they're basically a way of declaring variables that are durable and local to the object. Um, this is what's now going to replace our use of global variables. So in some sense, anywhere there was a global that before, now there's self dot. And all the functions in this object are passed self as, an, as a handle so that they can reference their own um, and elements. It's, I'm, I'm using not exactly the right Python language, but this is basically uh, you know, variables within the class, they're all um, instance variables. So that is, um, and then there's a few other things that happen here too. There's a table called peers, where as packets are received from the simulated radio, the robot, each robot logs the identity and location of the other robots that it has observed. And that is how it can detect who is, who is nearby and calculate a heading and distance to that other robot. So Let's go all the way down to the run function and just see how this is structured. Because there's a lot of functions designed to try to break up the various elements of both sort of da uh, data processing as well as behavioral elements into different functions just to break the code down into more readable chunks. So the run loop down here below is a lot like the kind of uh, event loop that we had uh, typically in the other sample programs. Um, it has an infinite loop. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, not exactly infinite. It has a, a loop where it waits for the time tick to elapse. And then when that is done, then that will exit, much as before. 
And then a few things happen on each iteration now. There's some polling functions that are called. Poll sensors decides when to process the sensor inputs and, and does so. There's poll communication in which uh, inter at intervals will uh, monitor the uh, poll the radio input and also report values back on the radio output. And then there's also um, some state machine invocation functions here. In this case, there's a, a, a switch between either the wandering activity or the following activity. And we'll get back to how those are coded. But they're basically, they're designed as non-blocking state functions that can execute some mode of the behavior. And those are what are handling the kind of overall behavior. And essentially, I'm going to ask you to write some variation of those, because those are what determine the overall behavior. Those, in turn, are calling a lot of other subsidiary functions that do helpful things. And many of the ones I provided should get you quite a ways, although you may want to provide some of your own. So let's just go back and walk through each of these, these sort of underlying functions one by one and just see what's going on. So I'm going to scroll up to poll sensors, because that's the first um, kind of meaningful bit here. Poll sensors has uh, it's, it's a line 105 in this particular version. There's basically three clauses, all very similar. There are timer variables that decide when to poll the sensor so that the sensor is going to be polled at some rate less than the full event loop rate. So like, for example, the GPS timer here, it's decremented by some delta of time. It's just a constant. Whenever it gets less than 0, then this clause will trigger, and it will reset the timer to a, to a reasonable value. And then it reads the GPS sensor. GPS reports a vector, so it's a three-element list. Um, the if not math is not a number is checking to see that the value is valid, because the very first reading can produce not a number values, which are invalid floating point values. So basically, all it does is if the, val if, if the timer has elapsed, then it stores the location in an in a instance variable called self.gps underscore location. So that's saving a vector in a place that other code can retrieve it from. This is our equivalent of a global now in this sort of class-based structure. The other two are very similar. Accelerometer timer is simply also just uh, at, at intervals will read this accelerometer vector and save it. Um, the, compass, the compass clause does a little bit more because one of, the, one of the bits it does here is convert the north vector into a heading. And in the comments, it says heading 0 degrees is north, 90 is east, 180 is south, 270 is west. This is a convention, a human convention. Um, it's notable in air navigation. Also, this is how runways are numbered, if you didn't know this. Um, a runway aligned, uh, I can't tell if it's, I don't remember if it's coming from the west or going to the west, will be runway 27, short for 270. So this heading number is the internal way that um, the, the sort of orientation of the robot is stored. It also will save the compass vector just for other purposes. But heading turns out to be just a human readable way to, to designate a direction. And by using the standard, it makes, um, makes the code internally consistent. So the math fmod da, 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 with the ATAN2, that is looking at some components of the orientation vector and calculating the current heading. Um, so that all happens effectively in the background. This is kind of like a background thread that at intervals simply fires these timers off and uh, reads the sensor values and does a, some minimal processing, not a lot of data processing, but a little bit. The next sort of routine background activity is poll communication. And this is um, using the simulated radio. The first, the first section of it is involved with reading the receiver. So there's, again, some polling interval that's evaluated. When the uh, timer goes off, then the, the, the radio is polled for as many packets as it currently stores. And so there's some checking of the queue length and then some getting, getting of data. And effectively here, it gets a string. It gets a, a what's actually in Python 3, a byte string and then does some sort of trivial parsing of it. The format of the string is a, is a, is a five, uh, five values separated by spaces. The first is a name token, then it's the XYZ location and heading of another robot. So this, this is some sort of minimal processing here to try to parse that string back into data and then um, do some storage of it. So if the format is valid, then it will end up getting a name token and end up uh, decoding it back out into some values. And, and uh, there's not a lot of error checking. There's a little bit of error checking to check for malform packets here. But the idea is every time it sees a report from another robot, it simply saves an entry into the dictionary that is the self.peers table um, that includes some fields. Um, the entry name is, uh, peers is itself a dictionary, and the entries in it are themselves dictionaries that contain the location heading and the timestamp of the reading. Um, stored as just normal Python lists and values. 
So this is how this particular robot ends up having some record of the most recently reported locations of, of the other robots in the scene, and then can use that to try to calculate some kind of heuristics. At once the radio timer, the receiver has been processed, then it always will transmit a packet. And here's where you see that it formats up as another byte string to send um, using um, its own uh, stored location and heading um, information and its own name token. So this is, this is the means by which this little system of robots um, senses each other. It doesn't really sense each other. They just tell each other where they are, and then they follow that. And certainly this could be fictitious. This robot could misreport its location, and the others wouldn't know it. Um, and perhaps that's a technique to consider. And then sending the data is just a, a call to send here. So this is, this is the sort of core means by which data goes back and forth. And this format we have to agree on, because this is also the format we'll use in the online version sent across the network to the MQTT server and back. So I'm just going to say that this, this format of a five token message um, can't be easily changed if we're going to interact with each other's robots. So at least in that space, that has to stay the same. Okay, let's think a little bit more. Let's go now down back down to our run function and look here at one of these activities. So let's, let's, let's get the, the poll wandering activity function and see what it does. So this is a, a function it cannot block because this event loop has to keep running. So this is a fairly typical state machine function, which uses a, a couple of variables to define the current state of the behavior. And then on each um, invocation of this function, we'll check some timers and check some update rules to decide whether to switch states, cause some side effects, you know, possibly produce some kind of change of, of uh, behavior, possibly produce some ongoing side effects like causing the motors to run and um, possibly changing between states. So this particular state machine, because it's the wandering activity, has a very simple regular structure where there's a single timer that every three seconds, that's 3,000 milliseconds, will trigger a change of state. So whenever um, this very first clause, uh, lines 273 and, and around there, um, whenever the timer expires, it resets the timer and then triggers a flag, timer expired is true, which is then used by the subsequent code. The main body of the code is a, what's in C would be a switch case statement, but in Python ends up as a long series of if, elif statements. It uses an integer state index variable to decide which clause to execute. And on every invocation, we'll just uh, choose one of these clauses. And each of them represents a different phase of the behavior. So uh, the init phase just moves directly into move motion. And then these other primitives are called. So go forward is a primitive that just tells the motors move forward at a given velocity which has units of meters per second. Um, and then you'll see if the timer's expired, uh, line 285 there, it simply advances to the next state. So then, then you know, after three seconds of this going forward, it'll move on to the go heading command, which will choose, a, you know, having previously chosen a random heading, will then reorient the robot to face along that heading. And then after three seconds, it'll move on to the next state. So it just operates on a clock moving between moving forward at a constant rate, rotating toward a heading, trying to negate the body wobble. The go still operator is a, is a controller that tries to basically zero the accelerometer using motor velocity. Um, and then a go rotate, which uh, rotates a, at a, I think at a fixed rotation rate. Um, so those are, those are some primitives that we'll look at again in a second here as we sort of go deeper into the code. But each of these has some, um, they're called, the, the functions here that go forward are called on every cycle because they potentially can uh, continually update the motor outputs. And in fact, for Go heading, we see that there is a closed loop controller running inside there. And then periodically, the other, uh, other rules in the state machine might, um, might come true, like if timer expired, and then there's some state transition to a different state. So this is a kind of basic formula for building out some form of, of modal state machine, modal behavior that switches between states, doing something slightly different in each state, and could have much more elaborate rules to define how, when, and when, and how things change between states. Um, but this is just a kind of a basic example. Um, there is a re-randomization here in, out of state four when it goes back to state one of the target heading, picks a new random number. Okay, so that is that is the wandering activity, and that that actually completely defines enough of a wandering behavior that the machine will kind of sort of navigate aimlessly around the arena, um, ignoring other robots. Nothing in this actually references the other robots although this, that wandering robot is reporting its state. Now let's look at the other state machine here, which is 
you'll see that there's actually kind of a, there's a field here called custom data. It turns out if you look carefully at the, um, at the two, at the sort of sample robots, one of them has custom data of leader and the other one, other ones have an empty custom data field. So this is like another way. You, there's sort of two ways that you can customize the behavior of this controller. One is by giving it a, a specific name that is unique. Actually, the names do need to be unique. This is wobbly one, I'm sorry, wobbly one, wobbly two, and wobbly three in the name field. Those are used for the name token, so they should be distinct. Otherwise, you'll just have some uh, collisions on your radio network where this multiple robots will report different positions. And then the custom data fields are for you to use. Uh, you can provide a string that is simply supplied to your code. And in this case, what that has done is um, it's read back into this mode variable, and then there's sort of two possible outcomes. The leader, the designated leader simply has leader in that field. It, it will always choose to do the wandering, and the other ones will do the following activity. So let's look now at the following activity and see what that does. Um, again, it's a state machine. It's actually a little, sim little shorter, although in this case, um, it has a couple different modes. So um, Basically, you can see there's sort of one clause which has a, uh, it says periodically test if there's a nearby peer. So every second, it looks at the recently received radio traffic by calling self.nearestPeer. And if there is a nearby robot, um, which could be none if, it, if nothing has been seen, but otherwise, no matter how far they are away, it will return the closest um, uh, robot. If that is, once that's returned, then there's a function that's called peer heading distance which will calculate the heading and distance to that particular robot, return a tuple. And then that is used as the new potential target for trying to follow. So these, again, functions are all defined within this class. All the code is up in, somewhere in this same file here. We can look at that. But the idea is, um, once a second, this robot just decides like what is now the nearest robot, and then calculates um, the heading that it needs to rotate to to face it, and the distance it is away from center to center distance. So those are then used. Um, and basically, uh, there is, there's just sort of two modes. Um, and uh, basically, if there is no nearby robot, the only thing that happens is the robot goes to the sort of stillness pose where it tries to like negate the body wobble. Otherwise, in most cases, there will be another robot. It applies a, a function where it computes the difference of heading between where it is facing and where it should be facing, and then uses the go heading function to try to turn in that direction until it has um, reached some uh, moderate uh, error, less than 20 degrees. So it's not that well aligned, but modestly well aligned, at which point it'll try to move forward along the target velocity. So it'll, as long as it's, um, uh, as long as there's a big difference between where the other robot is and where it's pointing, it will try to rotate to line up with that other robot, and then it will try to move forward at some velocity, which is a linear function of distance. So this will tend to pivot toward the robot uh, when it's approximately facing the robot um, and not moving too fast. It will um, roll forward to try to get to it. And then uh, as it approaches, it'll slow down, so it'll tend to stop before it has actually reached it. So that's a, that's a very minimal definition of a following behavior. And as we, as we can see from the example, it tends to reach a fixed point where the two following robots are each following each other and neither of them move very much. Um, so that, that could clearly be improved. I think the thing that's really missing here is a, is a specifically named robot to follow. Um, if, the, if the custom data field was used as the designated uh, leader for any given robot, then the... Um, uh, there could be a new function written that would look up that robot, and if, it, if, it, if the robot knew where that was, could calculate the heading and distance to that robot and then follow it. But that's sort of left for you to do. I did not actually yet write that function. Um, although if we write one, we should just share it, because that's a kind of a very useful primitive and could be the basis for building conga lines and other kinds of behaviors. So just to kind of reset here and, and figure out where we are, we were looking at the run loop. We saw there's some background activity involving sensing, sort of management of the body of the robot. And then there's some state machine that handles behavior. And that is where I want you to focus your efforts on trying to devise some new behaviors, possibly writing some more state machine functions. But let's go back now and look at a few of the primitives to see what's happening kind of below the hood here on the motion. So I'm going to go back up to um, the go still function, um, which is a linear controller uh, with only one coupling. Basically, the, the x 
a component of the acceleration vector, um, which will be zero when the robot is vertical and motionless, or mo vertical and moving at constant rate. Either one will involve zero acceleration vector. It calculates a velocity feedback and then uses that, applies that to go forward, so that if basically if it's if it's tilting forward, um, it will try to drive so that it will tend to lift itself back up again and actively damp the wobble. And there's no guarantee that this will result in a zero net velocity, but uh, in practice, it seems to do that. So I won't claim it's a terribly well formatted controller, but in the, in the simulated work world, at least, it is uh, damping out and returning to vertical. Let's look at, at some of the, at the go forward now, because we definitely use that as a primitive here. So go forward um, basically commands a uh, wheel motor velocity. This is using the underlying PAE controllers that are provided by WeBots. The advantage of that is they run at the simulation rate. Even though this particular controller is only running at about five times per second, the simulator itself can compute underlying PID control at the sort of full uh, disc you know, minimum discretization of time of the simulator itself. So when we command a velocity here, the, motor, the underlying motor model will achieve asymptotically some velocity that we command, and we don't have to worry about kind of high bandwidth control of the motors. This kind of layer control is actually pretty typical in robot controllers. There's very often some like low-level hardware loop that handles kind of position or velocity control of a, the underlying system, and then the high-level controller runs a lot more slowly and effectively issues commands to a low, lower-level controller. What's harder to do then is like very fluid torque-based control that tends to be very high bandwidth and tends to require having a lot more math at the lowest-level control loop. So that aside, beside here, we're basically just setting velocity. So the purpose of go forward here is primarily to translate a linear velocity into a wheel velocity. And what we can see is on line 184 there, theta dot equals velocity divided by the wheel radius is that this is a straightforward mapping that um, it's just using the fact of the definition of a radian actually, that a radian is an arc length divided by a radius to calculate the angular velocity for any given forward velocity. And it is sine, so a positive velocity will, will generate a positive rotation of the wheels and the axes of the wheels are chosen carefully so that positive on both wheels will drive forward and negative will drive backward. So let's go forward. Let's look at go rotate, which is right below it. Um, this is not that dissimilar, except now the axle length also comes into play. There is a, it's really the difference in linear velocity is the axle length times the rotational velocity um, that has been requested. Um, and then that itself is translated to now the, the linear, the difference in linear velocity of the wheels is translated by the radius to the difference of velocity of the wheels. And then in this case, that's applied symmetrically to the wheels. I mean, kind of ca catching the phrasing this carefully because an astute observer will note that it's actually possible to uh, rotate at any around any point along the line that goes along the uh, parallel to the wheel axis, or th actually through the wheel axis. And this difference is the same for each of those um, center or rotation points. So if, if the wheel velocity, if there was a bias applied so that the, the net velocity was the sum, but there was some other term applied to the wheel velocity, effectively you could superimpose a rotation and a linear travel to get a motion that would be more general. It wouldn't just be rotation in place, it'd be rotation around a, set, a rotation center somewhere along the wheel axis. And the outcome would effectively be the superposition of forward and rotate. But again, I haven't written that primitive. You could actually combine and have a a go forward and rotate, or a go forward, a, a ro um, sorry, a go while ro uh, pivoting around a rotation center. And the math would be basically the superposition of these functions. And you could have a little bit more freedom to move along arcs in the plane. But again, I kept it very simple. So there's basically a kind of turn in place and a move along a straight line as the primitives. And with some additional math, those could be superimposed to follow more general arcs. But I haven't actually provided that for you. Okay, that is most of the kind of code walkthrough here. Um, there's more subtlety in the sense that there's like some heading calculations, uh, primitives here. Um, probably the last thing to look at is just the management of the radio data. I don't think you need to actually uh, in, to interact with that directly, um, but let's just sort of, I want to acknowledge that it's there in case you sort of see it and kind of wonder what it's doing. So remember this peer dictionary is storing records of recently observed robots, other robots in the world. So the peer heading distance function um, says, given one of those records, um, calculate the distance and heading from the current location. So the record itself is a dictionary. So there's a few steps that 
um, basically Locke looking up in that dictionary to finding the location of the other robot. It, this particular function doesn't care about the heading of the other robot because the robot's just considered to be a point. And so this takes the difference, dx, dy is the difference from the current location, and then there's some uh, uh, arithmetic here, basically trigonometry, trigonometry to do a uh, Pythagorean theorem to find the distance, and then again a sort of heading function that uses the a tan 2 function and some various sort of scaling operations to get a heading in the kind of traditional compass heading. And then that's returned as a tuple. So the key here mostly is the other robot is treated as a point location. There's a vector from the current robot location to the other robot that's found. That vector is then interpreted as a heading and a distance, and that's the tuple that's returned. Nearest isn't much more complicated. Nearest does the kind of simplest possible solution of simply iterating through the peer list, find, calculating the heading and distance to every other robot that it knows about, and then choosing the best answer to return. So there's no special you know, efficiency data structures here. Uh, it's just a order and a walk through the list of other peers. And that'll scale up fine for the you know few units to maybe a dozen robots that we expect to see in this world. Although I will say, if you started to scale that up, if you had 100 robots, the time for this kind of execution would start to climb as you had an n-squared calculation of nearest neighbor. Um, but that's just saying that when we have a small world, we can get by with fairly simple algorithms and not do anything too sophisticated. That's most of the code here. That actually is the sort of complete model of the robot. And um, I will separately address networking, and then we'll see how that, that comes about. But those are all the major features. What I encourage you to do is to, is to first sort of plot out some ideas about what the behavioral script you want it to follow might be. If you have more than one, think about how you might switch between them by having you know, two or more scripts that are kind of embedded in the script. I recommend keeping one overall script file Although if you wanted to just fork it and modify them separately, that's also possible. It does make it harder to have common code that's shared across all of them. The, uh, and then once you have some behavior mapped out, uh, figure out if it's modal, it has some states, we have a state machine for it, and then decide, can you simply use the existing primitives, which basically boils down to, you know, turn along toward a heading, turn toward another robot's heading, move toward a robot, move in a velocity. If those primitives are fine, then simply use those. Um, but if you'd like to have a little bit more elaboration of the motion, if you want to follow an arc, write a new arc function, um, if you have some other idea about how to do, if you wanted to pump the wobbliness in some controlled way to get a bigger wobble, all of those um, could be new sort of underlying primitives. And if you layer the code in the same way that I followed here, that you, you know, following the example, I think you'll end up with a lot of reusable parts that will make it easy to construct a more elaborate behavior.